Today is January 25th, 2012. My name is Dr. Michael Berna, and I'm here today on behalf of the Library of Congress Veterans History Project, a project that captures and archives the oral histories of the men and women who served in one or more of our nation's conflicts. We are in Manesson, Pennsylvania, at the Manesson Heritage Museum today to interview Mr. George S. Essey, a veteran of the United States Navy. Welcome, Mr. Essie, and thank you for agreeing to share your military experiences with the rest of the nation. You're quite welcome. It's a pleasure to be here. Mr. Essie, I'd like to start a little bit about your background, where you grew up, and, and tell us uh, all the way up through maybe your high school days. Very good. I was born and raised in Manesson, uh, born on Ross Traver Street. Uh, later on, my parents moved up on what is called Hoover Street. Funny story about Hoover Street. People never knew there was a Hoover Street in Manesson. And um, we were up there, we had uh, no, uh, no indoor uh, toilet facilities on the hill until we, the men on the hill, built the water line and put it in. We had finally got an indoor toilet in 1952. So you talk about rough living. We, we had rough living, and we appreciate what we have today. I uh, went to Manesson High School. Uh, before that was at the Ben Franklin School, and then... Uh, went up to the junior high school and then the high school graduating in with the class of 1953. Uh, after that I signed up for the Navy immediately and it took me a year and approximately two months before I got in. And uh, when I went to inquire why guys signing up after me went and I'm staying in Manesson and they, they said well because you didn't tell us of your past history and I says like what? He says, you have a police record. I says, yeah, I know I do. And I told you. And I explained to you. And we start talking. He says, oh, yes, you did tell me about that. I says, yes, I did. I don't want nothing hidden, you know. So anyhow, I had to come back to Manesson. I had to get the reference from the mayor of town, Hugo Prenny, and I got it from Joe Check. He was the funeral director and school board, I believe, or city council, and another person. And as soon as I turned it in, two weeks, I was off to the Navy. Where, where, uh, let me stop a minute. What was life like back in, in Manesson at that point in time? Well, we had, it was a beautiful life. We had over 20,000 people in the city of Manesson. Uh, right, you walk through town, I mean, it, you would be bumping into people, to, you know, try to get around. Uh, it was just all kind of business, and uh, you knew everybody. Even with 20,000 some people, you knew almost everybody in town, one way or the other. And uh, it, was, it was a pleasure growing up. And uh, as kids, I lived on, like I said, Hoover Street. We lived up where the city dump used to be. And we used to play football, basketball, and baseball on the, on the city dump field. And if you can imagine the glass and the tin cans and everything else on the field, we always fell, we got hurt, nobody cried, nobody went to the hospital, nobody sued anybody. <laughs> it was a good life, was a good and uh, and uh, the old story I keep hearing on the computer, uh, the internet, uh, you would your parents would whistle. I don't care how far they lived, they would give a whistle, and each kid knew their parents' whistle. As soon as that whistle came, every, that particular person said, "See, guys, I gotta go," and they left. And uh, we we never got in trouble up there. Uh, we never sued anybody. Uh, Played rough football, basketball, no protective gear. Uh, if, if you fell and broke your arm, next day you were out playing with a cast on your arm. Today, we got a bunch of sissies. <laughs> We've got so happy people. Uh, but this this was a life in Manesson. It was it was tremendous living and so forth. Um, but there was that. And and that was the the war was going on as you were as you were a young man. Yes. And so during the World <coughs> War Two, was there any kind of what was the kind of the feeling about the war in Manesson amongst the people in Manesson at that time? Well, I had a brother who was in the Navy, and that's where my ambition was to get in the Navy. And he was in uh, uh, on the USS Arkansas battleship, and uh, it was a very uptight feeling because uh, we had the little banner in the window with the red star, and uh, you always worried where was my brother at. We, ne we never knew, he would send us a code in his letters, but if we didn't know the code until he, maybe a letter or two would follow, and he would say, uh, he would give another code like, you know, 
first letter of every fourth sentence, or mm -hmm. and but. Uh, but the banner in the window was for when people were the red star. Other? Yeah, the red star meant you had a son or a daughter in the service. Okay. If you had two red stars, it's two children, if, and so forth. Uh, the gold star, you had a son or a daughter was killed. Okay. And, uh, but you knew everybody had them in their windows. And uh, my brother made it through the uh, service. Uh, he came home when the war was over. Celebrations was very minimal. We had air raid uh, uh, warnings. Uh, every so often the sirens would go off and all the lights would go off in the house and the wardens would walk around. And a lot of times you would get a little small flashlight and you wanted to read because, I mean, a young kid, you know, I was eight, nine, ten years old, you want to read, so you take your little flashlight and you're by your comic book. And next thing you know, you got to tap on a door. Who's ever upstairs, tell them to turn that light off. So they, they uh, uh, it was, it was, it was not frightful. It was uh, eerie. Mm. Uh, complete darkness, no lights, no nothing, and so forth. But, uh, but that was about it. Uh, and uh, and then, so your brother was in the war, and you said that was yeah. your ambition. That's what created your ambition. Oh yeah, the, yeah. From uh, from, from him talking about the navy, and that, that that's what I wanted, and that's where I I went. So. Uh, I graduated, like I said, got, finally got in the Navy, joined in 19, uh, they took me in 1954. I got in when the Korean War was on. And as I finished boot camp, the Korean War, thank goodness, was over. So I got credit as a Korean veteran, mm -hmm. although I never left the state of Maryland. I was in boot camp. But I still got in time to be classified as a Korean be uh, benef uh, uh, veteran. Uh, I went to uh, Bainbridge. Uh, training center and after three months of training there I went to the hospital core school at Bainbridge. Graduating from core school I got assigned to uh, Bethesda Maryland Naval Hospital. Uh, I was a corpsman, I worked on certain floors and then I got assigned to the pediatric ward, took care of uh, the kids and so forth. One of the stories that I loved about the pediatric ward uh, it was also the uh, uh, prenatal and uh, uh, the pregnancy ward. I can't think of the word I want to say right now. But uh, as an enlisted man, the officers were like the elite corps. And one lady come in and she was pregnant, due any time now, and uh, she was going to the ladies' room and I said, you have to take a bedpan with you. And she says to me, son, you don't know who I am. I said, I really don't care who you are. You're pregnant. you got to take the bedpan with you. So we had a little bit of an argument and I says, you will take the bedpan. Uh, about two minutes later, you hear a big screaming coming out of the ladies' room, and we all charged in here using the bedpan. She passed the baby. Mm. Well, I made a good friend. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's, it's like I told her, I said, you never know what's going to happen. If you didn't have that bedpan, now what? You know, the baby's in the drain and so forth. Uh, took care of uh, young kids. Uh, the, one, the one girl, she was a very special girl, and um, she had... Uh, multiple, no, that was the commander had that. I can't think of what she had. And uh, I took care of this girl. I was on a special watch with her. And uh, the one time I was on leave and she she started screaming. And uh, uh, unfortunately, she, she was a hemophiliac. And by her screaming, she wanted George back. And they couldn't get hold of me and so forth. But she cried and cried where she started bleeding internally. And unfortunately, she passed away. That was a hard one. Uh, from core school. Uh, <coughs> Excuse me. Was it your choice to go into the, the medical side of things? Well, they gave you a choice where you wanted to go. And of everything they had there, that sounded the most promising because they said what you learn here, you can apply in civilian life. And uh, I figured, you know what? I would like to be a, a male nurse or get into the doctor's line. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but uh, when I got out of the Navy, I found out that was, that was not true. I went to the Charlotte Manesson Hospital, I applied as a male nurse, and they said, you gotta go to four, four years of schooling. I says, I've had more training than 90% of your nurses here. Uh, I did major operations, I did, uh, uh, as a matter of fact, I was the operating room technician, I was the narcotics uh, caretaker, uh, I sewed people up 
that got hurt and so I've had everything possible that you can get in nursing and I don't think 90% of the nurses here know how to sew an eyelid up. They said, well, you still need four years of schooling. I said, well, goodbye. I left. And, uh, but other than that, uh, uh, from the core school, I went to the medical school command in uh, Bethesda, Maryland, and worked in the, uh, they used to put out a, a medical newsletter every month, and we ran the presses, and we ran the addressing machines. And I wanted, uh, wanted to get married. No, my son was going, my wife was going to have the first baby, so I put in for annual leave. And they turned me down. They said, you can't go. I said, what do you mean I can't go? He says, well, you're too valuable. We have a note on your folder. No transfers, no leave, no nothing. I said, okay. I said, well, if I can't go, I says, uh, your next month's publication will not be out on time. I will make sure the machines are busted. Well, I got a phone call that afternoon. My leave's been approved. <laughs> okay. Got home. The wife had the baby. <laughs> I come back. I have my transfer papers. <laughs> So they found out right away they can run without me, and uh, I got transferred. The guy before me, he went to the uh, Fleet Marines. No, there was a guy after me went to the Fleet Marines. The guy before me, he went to the Naval Hospital in Hawaii, and I, I, I felt good for him, but I felt bad for the guy going to the Fleet Marines. Uh, if I wanted to be a Marine, I would have joined the Marines. I wanted the Navy. I got transferred to the uh, USS Lake Champlain uh, aircraft carrier, and. Uh, at that time, it was it was a CV-39. When I got on on board a month later, it was a, uh, reclassified as a CVA, an attack carrier. And what is the, what is the difference between the two? Uh, CV is just it's classification aircraft carrier. CVA is an attack aircraft carrier. And uh, after we came back from our med cruise in '57, we were reclassified as a CVS, which is a uh, submarine uh, detecting carrier. Uh, when I was on her, we had jets, we had the Cougars and the Panthers and the Furies and whatever and so forth. Uh, when we converted to the CVS, all we had was the helicopters and uh, the radar, the big planes with the big round belly on it. That was the radar things we had on there. Um, while we uh, got aboard there, uh, we made a uh, med cruise in January 57. There's a story behind that. I came home for Christmas. Unfortunately, that Christmas day, my wife's grandfather passed away, and the same time I had to get back to the ship. So my ride was in uh, Toledo, Ohio, so I had to catch a bus from here to Toledo. Uh, we were down in Mayport, Florida, and uh, it was a uh, dental doctor that we rode down with, and uh, I was running a high, high fever. Got back to the ship, and I was immediately put into, although I worked in sick bay, I was put in sick bay. <laughs> and, uh, after about uh, three or four days, the doctor says, we got to go to Shore Hospital, Jacksonville Hospital, find out what's what. And they found out that I had uh, infectious monoculosis. And uh, doctor, we were heading off for the med like about January 14, and this was like January 7, 8. And I says, uh, we can't let him go back to the ship. He has to st we're going to admit him here. And uh, Dr. Buxton at that time, he was an All-American football player with Dick Kazmaier. And uh, he says, no. He says, my George is going back to my ship. And he says, doctor, we can't let him go back to the ship. Doc says, okay, get the paperwork ready. <laughs> well, as they were getting the paperwork ready, Doc Bucks and Harry put my coat on, put my shoes on, and we ran out and got into the, <laughs> the ambulance waiting outside from the ship. <laughs> and we head back to the ship. <laughs> he and, hijacked uh, you. Oh, he hijacked me. I joined the Navy to see the world. Two years, I never left the state of Maryland. Right. So we got back to the ship. I was put in isolation the whole trip across the, the Atlantic Ocean. So I missed that. I, I For how long? How, how long was that trip? Uh, it was seven days. Seven. It took okay. our good old time. Uh, the Lake Champlain was commissioned in 1945, right as the war ended. It became a liberty ship. And what they did, they re restructured the ship where they went across and they loaded up all the GIs coming home. Mm -hmm. And they held the crossing the Atlantic speed record until Queen, Queen Mary II came and they beat that record. Well, you figured Queen Mary like seven years later with a new machine and all, mm -hmm. they beat our record. But we held the record for crossing the Atlantic Ocean with all the GIs on it. And how many, how many GIs would come on a trip? 
Well, that particular one, they said it was uh, wall-to-wall GIs. When I was on, we had uh, 2,300 men. Uh, when the squadrons came aboard, we went up to like 2,500 men and so forth. And uh, uh, my job on the ship, I was the uh, uh, I was in charge of the operating room. Um, I was a sanitation technician. And the job that I talk about and everybody last me, I was also attached with the public health service, the VD coordinator. Not that I went out and coordinated VD. Right. I went out, if you got VD, I had to do the interview. Mm-hmm. And uh, <laughs> interviewing some people was a lot of fun. Uh, one guy says, uh, uh, as his, we, we took the blood samples and everything else, and they were uh, analyzing it, and I had went to interview him, and I says, when was your last sexual encounter? He says, I'm married. I said, we don't care what you are. When was your last sexual encounter? He says, I told you I'm married. And I said, okay. Meantime, uh, Jim Nair, who was the uh, laboratory technician, he hollers out, he's got it. And this is what? He says, he's got five, not one, five, five VD diseases. I can give you the names of him, but that really doesn't mean very much now. And uh, so I told him, I says, when was your last time? So he wouldn't tell me. In the meantime, another satyr comes in the room, and he says, I want to talk to Mr. Essie. I go out, and he says, hey, George, you've got to help me. I says, why? He says, I was with him. I says, oh. I says, what happened? He says, well, we found these girls. There was a pimp. And uh, we went. He says, he did the girl first. I did the girl second. He said, well, I'm doing the girl second. He's doing the pimp. The pimp was loaded. <laughs> so I went back in the room, and I says, uh, hey, married guy, we've got to get the public health on this because your wife's in grave danger. He finally admitted what he was doing. And then once, once I notified the public health people, we're done with it. Mm-hmm. And uh, we didn't keep him on ship. We transferred him to the shore hospital right away. We didn't want him on ship. I mean, it was a dangerous thing. What part of the world were you in? We were in Portugal, first port we hit. (laughs) And uh, we gave lectures on VD, and it's very shocking how stupid people are. We showed movies. We did this on, you know, we showed maybe a thousand men at one time. We would show this stuff and warn them and so forth. And... uh, as soon as we hit port the next day or the third day, we were, uh, we have a lineup for a sick call. I mean, maybe 100, 200 guys. And uh, that, that was the fun part. That was the fun that part? That was the fun part. Not fun for them. Oh, no, no, they suffered. They suffered. And uh, I don't feel sorry for them, but, uh, yeah, you know. But uh, aboard ship, we hit Marseille, France in July of 57. Uh, I was the corpsman on, on duty that day. We were, we were anchored. Uh, people were going uh, ashore. They were unloading uh, the, uh, the barges with the uh, commanding officers' vehicles and everything else. And uh, an alarm come across, fire starboard side, fire starboard side. So I grabbed the first aid kit, and I'm running up the, we were three decks down. I ran up the first deck, the second deck, and as I go up to the hangar bay deck, I mean, you can see red flames like you can't believe. So I run back down three flights, and I hollered down and said, this is no drill. There is a fire. Well, everybody started going up. Uh, as I got to the hangar bay again, I start running toward the uh, uh, the elevator on the side where the fire is at, and I mean run, running to beat heck, and this one warrant officer, I swear he's about seven feet tall. He just puts his arm around me, and he picks me up. He says, son, you're not going anywhere. He says, you wait until they call for injured help. And as the fire is going on, uh, there's a call on the squawk box. Uh, medical corpsman needed at the officer's gangplank. So I start running up toward the officer's gangplank, and uh, Clyde Nall, who was a corpsman with me, he's running alongside of me, and he says, Hey, yes. He says, If you hear one bang, double your speed. He says, You hear two bangs, he said, You run like hell. If you hear three bangs, you make pretend there's another carrier in front of you and keep running. I says, okay, so we got to the officer's gangplank. He runs down. I started down, and I hear this uh, officer to deck say, Sailor, get back up here. I go back up, and I says, yes, sir, and I salute him, you know. He says, you didn't request permission to leave the ship. I said, what? 
He says, you didn't request permission to leave this ship. Navy terms, when you come aboard or leave, you have to request permission to come aboard or permission to leave. I says, sir, there's a fire and there's injured people. He says, you're on report. So I grabbed the clipboard, I signed my name, put my service number, I give back to him, I says, thank you, put me on report. And I ran down. I see didn't request permission to leave the ship. We got down and we brought up sailors. I picked him up. Uh, now, he's burned. Third degree burns as I picked him up under his legs was about that much fluid from them and it just burst all over the place and uh, we got him up on on top and uh, stretcher we got a couple of sailors around down the sick bay so uh, the fire we lost five Americans and three Frenchmen that was a nasty fire and we were close to being blown out of this out of, out of the water altogether but uh, the guys they threw the uh, fuel tanks and they moved the airplane so they saved it. So uh, when it was all over, we the sick bay crew, H Division, we were commanded by the commanding officer. Our senior medical uh, officer, Commander Krasno, told us we did a tremendous job and all. And uh, I says, uh, Doc Krasno, I says, uh, one bad thing, I'm on report. <laughs> he started laughing. He says, would you do this time? <laughs> I said, well, you know, this is my first time on report, so I explained the situation to him. He says, you've got to be kidding me. You didn't request permission? I says, that's what I'm on report for. He says, don't worry about it. So four days later, I'm called up to the captain's office for captain's mass. Now, you have to understand this. Captain Luker just came aboard ship about five days ago, and uh, he took over the command of the ship. And when he came aboard ship, uh, he was out playing golf. He hurt his back. He called for a corpsman to come up and treat him. Nobody wanted to go up to see the captain. Well, what the heck? So I go up. Captain Luker, George Luker, he's from Ambridge, Pennsylvania. So we start talking. He's from Ambridge. I'm from Anesson. Uh, he served as gunnery officer on the USS Arkansas. As I mentioned, my brother was on the Arkansas. He was in charge of the 16-inch guns on the Arkansas. That was his station. He says, evidently, your brother worked for me. <laughs> so I got to know George Luker like this. So uh, I treated him, got him working real good, so I go to Captain's Mass. Ensign Partains is sitting in there waiting for me, and he's got this silly grin on his face. And I walk in the office, and Captain Lucas says, George, what are you doing here? <laughs> I says, well, Captain, it's like this. Ensign Partains put me on report. He says, for what? I says, well, you remember the fire? He says, yes. He says, I didn't request permission to leave the ship to go down and get the injured. You what? I said, I didn't request permission. <laughs> and I'm laughing. And he says, go. Get out of my office. I don't want to see you. And Partains went the silly grin to, like, I'm in trouble. <laughs> well, Commander Krasno came down and he says, George, you can't believe us. He called me. He says, Essie, you can't believe what happened. He says, Cat Maluker went up one side, down the other side, up the other side, and down and told Partains, says, I want you to do one thing in this ship. Nothing. I don't want to see you. I don't want to hear about you. Do whatever you want. You want to go AWOL? Go. Get out of, get out of, the, get out of my sight. That's, so, that's nice. So two years on a ship, we uh, sailed the Mediterranean. Um, that's when the uh, strife in Syria broke out, and we were dispatched to Syria. And we drove and we rode in a figure eight, four days, 50 miles off the coast of Syria. Again, I got called up to the captain's office. Uh, if we have a landing party, Mr. S.C., you are going on the first wave. I said, why me? <laughs> he said, well, you have a Syrian background. Evidently, you know the language. I said, oh, I know how to swear. <laughs> <laughs> I know how to cuss you out and cuss you up and down. I said, but uh, I can't speak it. I can understand it. He said, that's good enough. So we go, sure, you're going to be on the first wave. I said, okay. Uh, that's the closest I ever came to visiting my parents' homeland. And... Uh, I never did make it over there, so. Uh, but uh, well, well the back up a little bit here. The the uh, the reason you you were out, you say, doing figure eights around the area. We're just uh, patrolling in case they needed us. Uh, I think I was during the it wasn't the Six Day War, but there was a strife between the Syrians and the uh, Israel and so forth, and they were almost ready to go toe-to-toe uh, -to -toe in war. And the Lebanese were involved in yeah, this too. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and there was some involvement for, from the U.S. What I from what I read, yeah, 
that, that there was a CIA back maneuver something like that. in Lebanese right, and right, Lebanon, right, right. and it had caused a lot of civil unrest oh my, there. Tremendous amount, but uh, but we never did go uh, short, so, and we left there. Uh, we went as far as Turkey, Greece, Italy, Spain, Portugal, so I did get to see the world and uh, experience I would never trade for anything and so forth. Uh, I got discharged in uh, 58, um, worked different jobs. I finally applied for California State Teachers College at that time, uh, GI Bill, and went to school. I had two kids, and um, checks were supposed to come in the mail, but the checks never showed up. Checks never showed up. Meantime, post office called me for my interview, uh, and I got hired. So I quit college. And everybody says, you're crazy, you got the GI Bill. I says, yeah, I got two kids, I haven't had a paycheck, uh, GI money for the last three months. I says, you know, we're living off of bologna sandwiches and white bread. So I went to work at the post office and uh, I started out as a uh, uh, full-time substitute carrier clerk. One year I was promoted to a regular position as a uh, distribution clerk. Uh, and then I went from distribution clerk to a uh, window clerk, from window clerk in 1970. Uh, I applied for superintendent of mails and uh, two other guys decided not to run and I got the job as superintendent of mails in 1995. My brother died, 90, 74, my brother died in November, my dad died in February. Uh, I took time off to go to my dad's funeral and I got back to the post office and I had uh, orders from the Pittsburgh Sectional Center that my job was being eliminated and I'm to report to Pittsburgh Post Office immediately. A few phone calls and uh, I knew a couple of the guys in Pittsburgh and I got uh, transferred to the rod exam section. So I was on rod exams and from there I was able to get back to Manesson about seven months later and in 1990 I made Postmaster Manesson. In 92 they gave us a buyout and I said bye. But, uh, and I've been retired since 92. Uh, I'm working part-time right now at uh, the Postal Federal Credit Union, uh, the assistant treasurer and president of the board of directors, and uh, three kids, five grandkids, and eight great-grandchildren. Uh, Navy, uh, it was a tremendous life. Uh, I will say this, I, says, I think every congressman and every senator should be required to put time in the armed services before they're elected to either Congress or the Senate. It might sound political, but they don't understand what the servicemen are all about. Uh, they're here, they're protecting the country, they're protecting our lives, and these people down there can care less. Once once they get in the office, show me the money. Well, let's back up to that, to the, to that point. Back when you were in the military, mm -hmm. back in the Navy, mm -hmm. was there any kind of discussion amongst the men about the fact that uh, you know there was a disconnect between Washington and the people out in the in the trenches, so to speak? The only time discussion came about is uh, whenever uh, a pay raise, pay pay talk was on to give us a pay raise. Um, put it this way, my wife moved on with me when I was at Bethesda Hospital. I was making all of $84 a month. So when she moved down with me, I got an increase in subs, uh, subsidence uh, for living off base. Uh, I went from 84 to $92 a month. After two months, we went through our complete bankroll, and I told her, go home. <laughs> I mean, very simple, go home. We can't, you know, we have, again, we're back on bologna and white bread. And uh, so uh, as I, I advanced, uh, once I got aboard ship, I was a uh, petty officer third class when I got aboard ship, and within two years I made second class petty officer, which is E5, and I was frozen E5 until the day I got discharged. And uh, the pay scale wasn't any better. I think I was making like 180, 190 some dollars a month, and uh, that wasn't, you know, at that time I was not big money because outside people are making uh, 250. Not that much more, but uh, I mean, at least a lot more. You can live a little better than that. But the only time discussions of uh, people in Congress or the Senate would be whenever there was talk on a pay raise. And uh, we would get maybe a 
1.75 or 1.2. I mean, it was nothing that you would brag about. Uh, but other than that, you didn't dare talk politics in the, in the service because one way or another, you got to get back somewhere and uh, you to get back to your uh, whatever. And uh, we were very careful on that. Um, so why do you think you were frozen at E5? What, what happened there? Uh, they usually freeze a, uh, uh, a rate. My classification, again, corpsmen, uh, they had so many E5 corpsmen's there, I mean, uh, E6 corpsmen's on, on active duty, they had no positions open to put another E6 in there, another first class uh, petty officer in there. And usually as you advance up the line, I mean, it's a, you know, a more cushioned job and uh, they just didn't have any positions to put you into, so they just froze them. Mm -hmm. And when I got discharged, uh, they offered me money for uh, re-signing. Uh, I says, the only thing I want, give me my third strike. He says, no, we're not giving anybody third stripes. It's frozen. I said, well, I'm out of here. I'll give you another funny story. Uh, I knew on the ship, 2,300 men at the time, I knew approximately like 2,000 guys on the ship, being a corpsman. And the sanitation technician, I would check all the different compartments and uh, galley and so forth and uh, check for bugs and, you know, bed bugs, roaches and all. So I got to know pretty much of the crew on there. And the uh, day before you'd be discharged, you're not supposed to leave the ship. I had a white Liberty card. I can leave any time I want. So I left the ship. And everywhere we went, hey, Doc, you're leaving tomorrow. Have a drink. Hey, Doc, leaving tomorrow. Have a drink. I said, okay. So... I don't drink. I don't drink, but I drank at night. And the next morning, uh, this is what they're telling me. It says they're supposed to pull out at Mayport at 7 o'clock in the morning. They can't pull out because all the discharges have left except SE HM2. All day long, SE HM2 report to the uh, enlisted gangplank. SE HM2 report to the enlisted gangplank. I locked myself in my isolation ward my little office. I locked the door. No one can get in. Two o'clock in the afternoon, they broke the door. I'm in a top bunk. So they get me off. I go down to the bottom bunk, onto the floor, and I kept going. <laughs> I don't drink, but I'm going to tell you what. I drank. And uh, they, they dressed me. They put my neck chip on, cockeyed. They put a hat on me. The hat I had was no good because we threw it away, and I'm walking up there, and the officer says to me, don't even wave, just get off of the ship. <laughs> I hit the pier, no sooner I hit the pier, <laughs> the ladder went up in there, and they were off the sea. <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah. Uh, the other thing about the Navy, uh, you learn a lot. Uh, you learn a lot of uh, fellowship. I belong to the Lake Champlain Association. And uh, everybody was honored from the day we were uh, commissioned to the day we were decommissioned. Uh, they sign up, and uh, it's very, uh, it's a close knit group. Uh, I was on ship 56 to 58, but the guys from 45 to 47, I know them as well as, as the time I was on, and so forth. Uh, the other thing I like to talk about is. I wrote to the uh, association, and no one's ever challenged me. I said, other than Brooklyn, New York, Pittsburgh, Chicago, anyone with the city at that time, uh, we were when this all happened, we were down to about 12,000 people in Manesson, 20,000 down to about 12,000. I says, we had on the Lake Champlain from the city of Manesson, myself, Tony Basiglia, uh, Larry... Uh, Larry, 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 he was a state cop, anyhow, I think his name. Uh, the guy just died yesterday, obituary in paper, Don Thorne, Andre Dudas, uh, across the ocean, mayor, uh, the ex-mayor, can't think his name either, isn't that terrible? Uh, and, and then we have a, a guy from down in Mon City, but from Manesson, we had five people from Manesson on the Lake Champlain. Who can brag the bragging rights? And nobody's ever taken me up on a challenge. I've got answers back. We've had two from our town. We have had maybe three, but nobody's ever had five. And uh, I'm proud of the ship, proud of the Navy, whatever. Uh, did you all enlist at the same time? No, they... no. We were all there. I went in 54. Don went on in 55. 
he was in the Marines and he got attached to the Marine that detachment on ship. Andre, uh, Dr. Dudas' brother, uh, he was on, the Lake Champlain had a uh, history, we picked up Alan Shepard, first man in space, when he landed in the ocean, our ship is the one that picked him up. So Andre was on at that time, so he got to see that. Uh, Tony Besigla, he was with the uh, with the command staff, he was assigned to the ship, but he was on, I think, in 64, something like that. And Larry Oletzak, Larry Oletzak, he, he was on like 62, somewhere in that area. I was the first one that I know of. Uh, Mayor, his name just came to me and it lost me again. Mayor Ed, Ed Pelusi. He, he, was, he was a pilot on the ship. First time I seen uh, the mayor about the ship was at the uh, traveling wall, was at City Park, and I went with my Lake Champlain hat on there, and, he's, and I walked up and says, Mayor, I just wanted to let you know that I'm also a champ guy. He looked at me and says, oh my gosh, he says, the Lake Champlain. He says, George, you don't know how many, how many boards I took off the flight deck coming in for landings. <laughs> so I got, to know, I got to know the mayor pretty good, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of experiences. Uh, the five guys that got killed on the ship, they put them up, they were up in the uh, conning tires. Uh, they called me and a sailor from Tennessee, Moon Mullins. Uh, we both, I worked for Denver Rome Funeral Home in Manesson. So, and uh, he worked for a funeral home in uh, Tennessee. So they called both of us. We had to go up and take care of the five guys. And uh, the five guys, all we did was just pour formal formaldehyde on all five. I mean, they were burnt. No recognition whatsoever. That's how bad they were burnt. But for three days, we were waiting for the uh, fleet mortician to come aboard ship. Uh, this is no joke. The fleet mortician's name was Digger Odell. Hmm. People say, you're making that name up. I said, no, I'll get you the cruise book. But Chief Petty Officer Digger Odell came aboard ship, and he relieved us. And uh, Captain Luker at that time says, uh, I want you guys, you got open liberty. We're in port now for four days. Go come back, go, come back. We don't care when you come back. So we went uh, on, on, on uh, uh, for liberty, and uh, we drank. Again, I don't drink. I'm very serious about this. We drank, and we got, we drank so much, we sobered up. We drank, we sobered up. We drank, we, five times we drank. We were so drunk, we didn't know what side was up, but we sobered up. <laughs> and we went back to the ship sober, and they were really ticked off at us. I said, well, we forgot what happened. <laughs> and uh, but, uh, there was there. Uh, while we were in Istanbul, Turkey, uh, my heritage background is Syrian. My mother and father both were born in Syria. As a matter of fact, in a town that's been making the news, it's called Homs, H-O-M-S. And uh, the guys on the ship used to call me Arab. And I told them when we were in Istanbul, I said, whatever you do, do not call me Arab. This is why I says the Turks hate the Arabs. Do not call me Arab. So everything went real nice. We're heading back to the ship like about six o'clock in the evening. And the one sailor alongside me says, Hey Arab, let's get a move on it. Well, at that time it's big Turk, about six six six. He comes out of the hallway and he picks me up by my collar. He holds me up in an air about that far off the ground. He says, Are you Arab? I says, No. I'm, 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 I'm an American. Are you Arab? I says, no, I'm USS Lake Champlain. Looky, I'm a doctor, doctor, doctor. I had the caduceus on the arm. He says, are you Arab? I says, sir, no, I'm an American. I'm Orthodox. He puts me down. He looks, he says, what? I says, I'm Orthodox. He gives me a bear hug, which is worse than being up in the air. And he says, Orthodox brother. And he calls everybody out and he says, come on, quick, hurry. He says, we have an Orthodox brother with us. They want to know where I'm from. I says, from Pennsylvania. I go to the uh, Syrian Orthodox Church. Oh, boy, that was magic work. They took us in this place, a hall, maybe about 16 feet high, uh, about as big as the high school uh, gymnasium, and they throw a party for us. In fact, you can't believe it. I mean, food, dancing, screaming, hollering, and everything else. He says, son, if you were Arab, he says, you see this knife? I says, yeah. He says, you would have nodded your head. It would have fell off your shoulder. I says, thank God for being orthodox. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
they did the same thing to me in Marseilles, France. After the fire, we were in Marseilles, and uh, this was like the second day we were there, and I told them again, do not say Arab. Do not say Arab. Well, dummy said Arab on our way back to the ship. I don't know where these people come out from everywhere. And he says, we got an Arab here. And I mean, we ran. We found the shore patrol wagon right there. We said, get us back to the ship right away. And these guys are running after us. So they got us back on the, uh, the uh, car, took us back to the pier. We jumped on the boat and told them, back to the ship. Go, 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 go. We got back there and uh, they said, what happened? I says, stupid there, call me Arab. He said, oh my God. He said, that's the dumbest thing anyone could have done. That's I said, you're right. So, so, they said that was it, and uh, those are the things. One Orthodox saved me; the other one, the Liberty boat saved me. <laughs> but uh, that was my experience in the Navy, and I, I wouldn't trade it for the world. Well, it, it, uh, I just want to briefly touch you. Were you on board when they picked Alan Shepard up? No, that was in '62, somewhere like that. Oh, I got okay. off in '58. Was gone. Yeah. But the, the other thing that I noticed, it seemed that as though there was a great deal of respect. For the corpsman or, oh or anybody in the healthcare field. Yes, yes. Uh, the corpsman, the Marines treat the corpsman as God. Uh, our ship, although they hated the needles we would give them and so forth, I mean, we were very well respected on there. Uh, I, I don't think I would have picked a better profession other than corpsman. And it, to today, I use my. Uh, my knowledge from hospital course school, I use it. And say, uh, my wife's been very sick, and I think without my knowledge in the medical field from then, I'd probably have her in a nursing home. But uh, I think this knowledge I picked up from them has really helped me in life. As a matter of fact, while in civilian life, the first five, six, seven, eight years, ten years after that, people would get, their kids would get cuts and so forth, they would run to my house. And I didn't sew them, I used what was called, right now you can buy them on the market, butterflies. But at that time, nobody knew what a butterfly was. I'd take a piece of tape, cut two ends, two ends, fold it over, and pull the skin together. And how many kids are walking around town today with no scars? All from George's butterflies. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah, my parents put butterfly stitches on me more than once. Oh, well, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But we learned it. Uh, we had an incident. Uh, this was in uh, Laverno, Italy. <clears throat> During course school, the one instructor says, I'm going to teach you something that's not in the book. If you get a puncture wound in the lungs, and you can tell a puncture wound real fast, that's when you hear the air going. He says, that's a puncture wound. you got to stop that loss of air immediately or that guy's going to die on you. He says, so here's what you do. We all smoked at that time. He says, you take the plastic wrapper, the cellophane wrapper off your cigarette pack, you put it over that stab wound or whatever you have, and you tape it tight as can be. Put a 2x2, two 4x4, by two, by and tape it as tight as can be. I'm on shore patrol in uh, Laverno, uh, we called it Leghorn, Italy, and uh, they're screaming for Corman, 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 there's been a stabbing, and they bring this one guy up, and he's stabbed right in the back, and I mean, you can hear this air going, <laughs> well, right away I took my cigarette pack, I took that off her, and I slapped it on her, put on the uh, two by two for whatever it was, and I taped them down, called an ambulance, and they took him back to the ship real fast. I was in dress blues. The guy lived, we saved his life. Uh, dress blues with the piping on the sleeves and all. I had blood, blood all over that. Got back to the ship. Uh, our chief petty officer was aboard with me, Chief Edwards. And uh, when he got back to the ship with the sailor, he used the repair, he used the medical attention in the first person, him. He put this on her. He, I put this, I put that. Well, he got accommodation the next day. We had captain's inspection next day on flight deck. He got the accommodation. He got the re recommendation, accommodation for saving his sailor's life. And I mean, the guys on the sh we're lined up. I had to go for inspection. They wouldn't let me stay down there because it was inspection. All hands up on deck. I says, I'm gonna get killed. That blood, blood, blood. You know. He says, you got to go. I said, well, let me. Go. I no time. So we're standing there, and Chief Edward gets this commendation for saving a sailor's life, and everybody's going, he had nothing to do with that. So he walked away. So every April, I think it was April 29th, uh, I'd be rolling a buddy of mine from the uh, H Division. He lives in Eastern PA. I get an email. He says, the glorious day that George saved a sailor's life, and Chiefy took the credit. God rest Chiefy's soul. 
<laughs> so, you know, a lot of experiences, uh, medical experiences I had in the uh, Navy. Loved every minute of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll tell you, this, this has been a fascinating story, and it's just what an experience it was for you, for somebody from Manesson right. to go and experience the world like you did and, and be involved with so many different things. And sure, you did a lot more good for people than we've had enough time to even talk about here in the medical profession. Uh, in closing, is there anything you would like to add that, that we haven't talked about? No, I think I covered most of it. Uh, other than that, uh, Dr. Buxton I mentioned before, he was an uh, All-American football player from Princeton. I got to see him at one of our uh, ship's reunions. He's a uh, heart specialist right now down in uh, um, South Carolina, Charleston, South Carolina. And the wife and I went to that reunion, and I just took my chance to find his name in the phone book. Son of a gun, there he is. So I called him, and he picked us up the next morning, went to his house, and I mean, we just had one glorious time. And so, and he had his training here in Pittsburgh under Dr. Stargell. Mm. And he is a, uh, a well-known physician, heart sur uh, surgeon down in uh, there. And uh, he was a big man. And uh, he would always call me G-Hordes. And... Uh, oh, uh, one more story, then I'll wrap it up. Sure. Uh, the ensign that put me on report. We were in North Atlantic, and we were taking 27-degree rolls in the North Atlantic. 35 degrees, the ship topples over. Okay, we're taking 27-degree rolls. Sailors were getting seasick like you could not believe it. Officers were getting seasick. Well, anyhow, Ensign Partain's got seasick. He come down to sick bay. I mean, he is seasick. Dr. Buxton calls me, says, Gee, Horge, uh, got a sick officer here and you got to attend to him. He says, I have an important meeting I got to go to. So he pulled me aside and says, It's your buddy. Take care of him. Well, you know, it's, it's nasty what we do in sick bay. We don't like you, we'll take care of you. <laughs> so you take the needle. Well, I have to give him IV. So you take the needle and you, you hit the tip of it. Now it goes in beautiful. No problem. But when he comes out, it tears. Okay. So anyhow, I go to Ensign Partains, put it in. I can't find his vein. I said, you have a rolling vein. So we take the needle out, pinch again. You got a rolling vein. Can't do nothing. In, out, and about five times. I called, I went, I called Dr. Buxton. I said, Doc, you got to come down. I says, I can't. He has a rolling vein. I can't get it. So Doc Buxton comes in. <laughs> He said, by God, he says, it's, we can't hit your vein. Well, Ensign Partains at that time, he miraculously, he got well. <laughs> he says, the heck with you guys, I'm getting out of here. <laughs> he left. <laughs> we stood, we laughed, we laughed. And the doc says, are you happy now? I says, well, he didn't put me on report. <laughs> <laughs> but other than that, uh, it was a good life. It was a good life. I enjoyed every minute I was in the Navy. Uh, although I didn't get to the uh, war zone, I'll tell you what, we took care of a lot of, uh, a lot of injured people, uh, guys getting their elbows blown off by uh, 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 prop-driven planes, guys hit by planes coming in landing. Um, one airplane went overboard. I was on uh, flight deck duty. The catwalks and the ladders are about yay wide, and when this plane came in, and he crashed through the barrier and he was coming over where I was standing and I scooted down on that ladder uh, that maybe about 45 guys rode past me and no one stepped on me and uh, all I can remember is uh, Ivy Rowland coming over and he's hollering Essie, Essie where are you, where are you and I stood up and I'm right here and he says my god he's and the plane went over where I was at a gun mount and it ripped the gun mount off and these are the stories I mean the adventures in the Navy so Wartime or no wartime, it was, it was heck, mm -hmm. but it was enjoyable. Enjoyed every minute of it. Well, on behalf of our nation, we thank you for your service, and we appreciate you coming here today to share your story, and uh, thank you for all you've done. Thank you. Appreciate it. My pleasure, believe me. <laughs>